James Gunn. Wow, you do not mess around. I put a pitch out for my Man of Steel sequel on Nebula weeks before it hits YouTube, and that very same day the video drops on Nebula, boom, Henry Cavill is gone. I can't even really be mad. Well played. But what I didn't originally realize was that apparently this is not necessarily a recast for an origin. As you said, you just want a younger Superman. I can understand that. You probably also want to signal to audiences that this is its own thing. Disconnected from Man of Steel or any of that continuity makes perfect sense. I have some thoughts on who you should cast as Superman that I'm going to share in a DC fan casting video that will come later. But for now, Adam DeMarco, the kid from White Lotus, is probably a good pick depending on the age range we're going with. That doesn't mean I'm going to use footage of him for Superman in this video. The Henry Cavill footage I originally used works fine, but just imagine we're watching Adam DeMarco in these scenes, or whichever Superman fan cast you prefer. And since this is not necessarily an origin, my pitch still works. I'd need to tweak one or two very vague references to DCEU continuity, but besides that, this pitch works well enough as a reboot as it did as a sequel. And also, I think the tone of the movie and some of the things it has to say about who Superman is are the kind of thing that would set it apart immediately from the DCEU. So this can work. I'm going to change some things, interject a little bit, so if you saw the original on Nebula, you'll recognize the differences, but otherwise, I'm going to keep this video as close to the original as possible. Because my original pitch was built to function both as a sequel to Man of Steel and as part of a new continuity. It was not an origin, because... I don't think Superman needs another origin on screen. It has been done. And after all, Superman is perhaps the most well-known pop culture figure of the 20th century. We can expect the audience knows what his deal is. So if that's the case, we're going to tell a story about a Superman who has been at this for at least a few years. What story should we tell? Who is antagonizing the Man of Steel and why? How will this challenge help to define his character? Well, I've got something for you. Something that certainly is not the obvious answer, but keep an open mind and by the end, I think I'll have you on board. The biggest objective with this pitch is to get Superman back to where he belongs. As I said, the Superman of the last decade was written rather grim. He killed, he sulked, he died. But even though he said the word once or twice, he didn't feel hopeful. It definitely seemed like that was the direction they were taking the character in, but that's not what he's known for. And that should be the end game of any Superman movie. Superman gives people hope for truth, justice, and a better tomorrow. So the most important part of that pitch is that the movie will end with a Superman who occupies that space in the world. And to do that, I will center this pitch around one issue of Action Comics. Action Comics 775 is, in my opinion, the best Superman story. No, it's not the best comic with Superman in it, that's All-Star Superman, but I believe Action Comics 775, written by Joe Kelly with art by Doug Mankey, Lee Bermejo, Jose Marzon Jr., Wade Von Grawbadger, and Wayne Goucher, is the single issue of comics that sums up exactly why Superman continues to be one of the most important characters in the history of comics and modern pop popular culture. You may know the comic by its more common name, What's So Funny About Truth, Justice, and the American Way. And if you don't read comics, Warner Brothers actually adapted it not too long ago into an animated movie called Superman vs. the Elite that's pretty good. Doesn't capture what's fun about the art, but the essence of the comic is there. Basically, in that story, Superman finds himself in an existential crisis after a group of metahumans calling themselves the Elite, led by the punk rock telekinetic Manchester Black, shows up and starts dishing out a more brutal form of justice than the Man of Steel is comfortable with. They are not openly antagonistic at first, but eventually, Superman makes it clear that he's not going to let the Elite kill people, and the Elite make it clear that they don't care. And their powers rival that of Superman. You've got Manchester Black, who, like I said, an incredibly powerful telekinetic. Cold Cast, a man with the ability to control energy. Menagerie, a woman who has a bunch of space parasites. And of course, one of the greatest comic names in history, Hat. He's a magician with a hat that he can pull anything out of. So. They call him Hat. The four of them put the hurt on Superman and tell him that he's a relic of a bygone era. Old and busted, new hotness. Speaking of that phrase, the Men in Black are also in this comic. Kind of. And the issue ends with a fight between the Elite and Superman, which Superman handily loses, or so it seems, but Superman is not dead, and he's lost it. He goes bad, and one by one kills all of the Elite, even Hat, before beating Black in front of the entire world and lobotomizing him. Everyone is terrified, including Black, who calls out Superman's hypocrisy. You see, nobody is this good, he's just as bad as everyone else. But it's too late. Superman's gone evil, and it's all over. But right before he kills Black, Superman reveals that he set the whole thing up. 
up. The rest of the elite are safe and Black is only temporarily depowered. Superman has been in control this entire time. He wanted to show Black what this kind of violence leads to and show everyone why the world needs people like Superman who do what's right and believe in a better tomorrow even if it seems hopeless. Optimism triumphs over cynicism. And on the last page, Black screams that he'll always come after Superman, and if Superman doesn't think so, he's living in a dream world, to which Superman replies, I wouldn't have it any other way. Dreams save us. Dreams lift us up and transform us. And on my soul I swear, until my dream of a world where dignity, honor, and justice become a reality we all share, I will never stop fighting. Ever. It's perfect. Which is why it absolutely blows my mind that a certain Superman director sort of said the Manchester thing at a panel. I talked about how if you don't believe superheroes commit war crimes, you're living in a dream world. I will never get over that. Manchester Black is what Man of Steel 2 needs. Or Superman reboot movie. We need a villain who can challenge this new hopeful Superman physically and philosophically. Does the world need a Superman? Are we past that? Are we too cynical? Have Black just say it. Like tell Superman that this truth, justice, and the American way shtick belongs in the 50s. However, we do have a problem. The Manchester Black story is pretty short. The animated adaptation barely clocks in over an hour and they added a bunch of stuff. So I don't think we could just take this story and adapt it directly. Instead, I would mash it up with another idea. I think you can expand upon this idea by adding another character who does make an appearance in the original comic but doesn't do all that much and have him play a much bigger role here. It's the one thing that Superman needs more than anything else. Lex Luthor. Now we have problems. The first is the obvious one. Jesse Eisenberg Lex Luthor just does not work. Do I think he's a bad actor? No, I liked him in The Social Network, American Ultra, the movies where the magicians do crimes, Vivarium. He's very talented. However, I do not think he worked as Luthor. To me, Lex Luthor has a couple of essential qualities. The same way Superman needs to be hopeful, what does Lex Luthor need to be? Lex Luthor needs to be confident. He needs to fully believe in himself, his actions, and he needs to project that confidence constantly. Lex Luthor needs to have some charisma. Do people think he's a good guy? No, but he needs to be able to inspire confidence. Confidence. He goes out and makes a big speech about the alien menace, and people listen. Not everybody, but enough people. What I'm saying is, he can be as morally repugnant as, say, a Ted Cruz, but he also has the people skills that Ted is severely lacking. I mean, this guy was president in the comics for a while. Some people need to like him. Lex Luthor needs to always know what's going on until the last possible minute. Superman and everyone else in the movie, and we, the audience, need to believe Lex Luthor has a plan. He plays the long game. And even if it seems like the heroes have figured him out, he's 10 steps ahead. Lex is one of, if not the smartest person in the DC universe, so he needs to seem like it. Lex needs to be classy. He can have humble beginnings, sure, but Lex Luthor is rich. He's got money and he knows how to spend it. He's the picture of poise. So he's wearing a perfectly tailored suit and tie. Lex is imposing. He's the peak of human achievement. I'm not saying he needs to be a bodybuilder, but I'm saying he can't be a pushover. Like I can't be watching a movie thinking I could beat up Lex Luthor. He needs to be tough. Now let's look at Jesse Eisenberg Lex. Was he any of those things? I'd say he was confident. I think he had negative charisma, a huge creep from minute one. I don't think he knew what was going on. He felt more like he was just kind of improvising his plan. Was he classy? Sure. Was he imposing? Hell no. And I think it's incredibly clear in 2022 specifically why this Lex did not work. Back in 2015, we had a lot of ideas about tech billionaires. They were geniuses who were going to use all of their resources and determination to become real life Lex Luthers. And if 2022 has taught me one thing, it's that tech billionaires are not Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor would not lose billions of dollars on dumb VR office land headsets that nobody wants. Lex Luthor would not wear a cowboy hat to his stupid rocket ship thing and spray champagne all over William Shatner. And Lex Luthor would not buy a social media platform and spend all day reposting bad memes on it so he could get the approval of a bunch of weird nerds. Lex Luthor would never tweet. So I do not think actual billionaires were the right blueprint for a modern Lex Luthor. And unfortunately, that means Jesse Eisenberg probably wasn't the right pick for the character. So I was not sure. I've thought about this a lot. Who do you cast as Lex Luthor? The thing is, if we're doing a younger Superman, a lot of these actors, your Brian Cranston's, your Mark Strong's, they're on the older side, and one thing that I associate with Lex Luthor is he's around the same age as Superman. Like, obviously, there could be maybe a 10-year difference, maybe even a 20-year difference, but they can't be from different generations. They have to feel like contemporaries, because sometimes Lex Luthor grew up in Smallville and even kind of knew Clark Kent. I'm not sure if that is currently the canon backstory for Lex Luthor, but you just get the sense that these guys are supposed to be very similar in as many ways as possible, so you don't want a young Superman and an older Lex Luthor. 
at least in my opinion. You know what? We already have one White Lotus kid. What about Theo James? Maybe I'm just a prisoner at the moment here, but I think he was good on that show. And he has the kind of jerky energy that I would expect from Lex Luthor. He can play a character that exists in the business world, but is not a total pushover. He may be completely miscast for this. I only know him from White Lotus, but for now, Theo James. So what's the movie? Well, Clark is settling back into his life as a reporter for the Daily Planet. He's engaged to Lois Lane, and he's working on figuring out who Superman is in this new world that is full of superheroes and villains. The Daily Planet sets up a live interview between Lois and Luther in a packed auditorium. Obviously, Clark comes with, so does Jimmy. The event is some sort of premiere of a new technology. Lois interviews Lex on stage. So, Mr. Luther, please call me Lex. Lex? You've certainly been busy over the last couple of months. People are curious. What is Lex Luthor's next big idea? Well, at its heart, LexCorp has always been a company dedicated to using scientific breakthroughs to make life better for every human on the planet. And that's what we're going to keep doing. And now, LexCorp is partnering with Ironworks, a small engineering firm outside of Bloodhaven, to make a flight suit that will give first responders the ability to fly across the city in seconds. Stopping crimes, rescuing people. Why should Superman have all the fun? And this is where we'd introduce the only other main character of Note, an old favorite of mine who deserves a spot in a movie that does not star Shaq, John Henry Irons. John Henry Irons walks on stage with a version of his flight suit. It's sort of like a stripped down version of the Mark II Iron Man suit. As far as who plays him, I'm just gonna say for now John David Washington, just because he's in the right age range, he's a pretty good actor, and he's not tied down to any of these other franchises yet. I'm sure there's plenty of other actors people would like, but you know, I think JDW could do it. Plus, his first name is John, so, you know, that would probably help in some way. If you're not familiar, John Henry Irons is the alter ego of a hero named Steel. He was introduced in Adventures of Superman 500, and he is mostly known for being one of the characters that takes up the mantle of Superman after Superman was killed by Doomsday. He's an engineer, so he's got more or less an Iron Man suit with a big ol' hammer. It's a very cool design. They made a movie about Steel, and it is so bad that we never even talk about it. Like, it's never on lists of people's least favorite DC movies because it's so bad, most of us have blocked it out of our memory. But it does exist. Anyway, Irons walks out onto the stage. Thanks for the introduction. We at Ironworks are happy to be working with LexCorp on this project. It's been my dream to be able to fly. And I remember on that day, almost a decade ago, how much I wished I could. We lost so many people. So many families were torn apart during the attack. My hope is that next time some alien or monster or God knows what comes into our city, we can use these tools to keep our friends and families safe. The crowd cheers. Luthor goes in to shake Iron's hands. Lois asks one question. Speaking of our resident protector, do you have a message for Superman? I'm sure he's interested in how you feel about him. Luthor pauses. I'm glad he's back. Metropolis needs its protector. But I hope one day, LexCorp can put him out of business. So Irons is working under Luthor in this movie, creating the precursor to the steel suit and what will eventually be Lex's war suit. And we understand this character here. He's a regular guy who felt helpless because during some superhero fights, people close to him were killed and he couldn't do anything about it. So he's building his own suit to help. We can have some character moments after this scene where Clark says he feels guilty for what happened to Irons. Lois tells him there's nothing he could do. Clark wonders if that's true. Then we get our first big action scene. Although you could also open the movie with a scene that's very much like Mewtwo's escape from his prison in Detective Pikachu if you want a quick action scene setting the table for a dangerous threat. But this action scene should be Superman fighting someone, doesn't really matter who. Maybe Reactron, or Toy Man, or Silver Banshee a minor villain who Superman can beat by himself, but still needs to take seriously. And in a moment where Superman is caught off guard and it looks like the villain will win, someone appears and knocks the villain out, and this is our introduction to Manchester Black. I think this is the perfect role for Tom Holland. I'm kidding. As far as actors that could play this role, I don't know, maybe Sam Claffin, John Boyega? I mean, Robert Pattinson would be perfect for something like this because Manchester Black needs to be both strong confident, but also he needs to feel punk rock and gritty in a way that someone like Tom Hiddleston might be a little too pretty for. Dan Stevens is another favorite of mine for casting just because I think he has a lot of range. I think actually he might be my ideal Manchester Black. 
He helps Superman up, says he's a big fan, and the two fight the villain together. The villain damages a building and Superman needs to go and catch some debris to protect some people. And when he does, he sees Black has disarmed the villain with his telekinesis. Superman is relieved, but then Black executes the villain. Everyone is shocked, silent, until one member of the crowd cheers. Then a couple more do, and then about half the crowd is cheering on Black. He makes his introduction to everyone. My name is Manchester Black, and I'm here to protect you. Metropolis has been through too much. Too many innocent people hurt, killed. I'm here to stop that, permanently. And anyone who gets in my way will end up like him. Black motions to the dead villain. Then Black flies away. Superman tries to follow Black, but loses him. End of Act 1. And that is the core of the movie. Superman dealing with Manchester Black's new form of justice. The hierarchy of power in the DC Universe has changed. Black is up there with Superman, and Superman is torn. Over the course of the movie, our side characters each also get a plot. Lois and Jimmy try to figure out who Manchester Black is, your classic Lois Lane investigation. Irons has his own internal crisis as he's building the suit. He gets worried that this is actually what he wants. Manchester Black solves problems in a new way. Irons knows it's wrong, but he can't help wanting to see some of these villains punished. And Irons is important because he's our non-superpowered, non-already friend or enemy of Superman character, so we're gonna see a lot of this through his eyes. And Luthor sees an opportunity. The public is split on Black. We can see on the news about a third support what he's doing, a third are firmly against it, and then a third are not sure one way or the other. So Luther realizes that by supporting Black, he can use this wave of popularity to get more power and run for president. They will run on a zero tolerance policy for metahuman crime and say they will support Manchester Black and anyone like him who wants to do what the alien can't. And that's your first half of the second act, which will end with Superman and Black's second meeting. This time, a magical enemy threatens Metropolis. Superman goes to try to stop it, but fails since he is weak against magic. And then Black shows up and easily disarms the villain. And as Black is about to kill the villain, Superman steps in and hits Black. The moment is seen by all of our main characters who are watching either from the ground or on TV. We can also see this from the perspective of some other people we haven't met yet, with interesting, distinct silhouettes. Black gets up, he and Superman square off. What's wrong with you? The wizards scramble your brain? I'm the good guy. Good guys don't kill, especially not people who are surrendering. Surrendering? Hmm, why is that? Oh, so he can go to jail and then get broken out, and then what? Back again. Tell me, how many times have you fought him before? Twice that I can remember, and every time he gives up and you do exactly what he wants. You give him another chance. Everyone deserves a second chance. And a third? And a fourth? Tell these people right now that you're okay with some of them dying next time. Collateral damage, there's nothing you can do. You can't cross that line. Once you kill, you're just like them. Well, I guess I already am, so what's the harm? One murderer off the streets to save everybody here? I'll take that deal. That's not the point. There are so many people in this city that lost everything because you don't have the will to act. Well, I'm sick of it. And if you want to stop me, go right ahead and try. I don't want to fight you. Black gets ready to kill the villain, and that starts the fight between Superman and Manchester Black. And this is your midpoint. Superman is able to hold his own against Black, but Black is not a pushover either. They're playing different games though. Superman is holding back, trying not to kill Black, but Manchester Black is going all out. He knows this is his best chance at killing Superman and he's gonna take it, but eventually Superman knocks Black down. You've lost, give up, I can help you. I don't need your help. And Superman is caught by something and pulled back. He is surprised to find a new metahuman who gets between him and Black. And this is our intro to Coldcast. He says, someone finally makes a real difference and you fight them. I used to think you were a hero, but now I realize you're just part of the system that keeps getting people killed. And this is your midpoint reversal. Coldcast and Manchester Black fight Superman. And just when Superman begins to get his footing, Menagerie appears and then Hat and join Black and Coldcast. All four villains fight Superman and beat him bad. There are even some points where Superman tries to run away and they don't let him. This is punishment. And the fight ends with Black knocking Superman into the distance. Superman lands in the ocean and sinks to the bottom. Superman is gone. The second half of Act 2 is the rise of the elite. They get more support, now 40%. And Luther meets with Black. Luther tells Black, I admire what you're doing. Someone needed to stop the alien. I know who you are. I'm not working with you. You know he changed his little catchphrase. He said he stood for truth, justice, and the American way. But then the American way became a better tomorrow. And I don't really care about dropping the America part. 
but a better tomorrow? Everyone in this city fears tomorrow. They can't help it. They know that some monster's always just around the corner. Maybe Superman would save them this time, but because he played by their rules, the monster would always come back. You give them peace, a real better tomorrow, one without the monsters he protects. So what do you want? To support you. I'm sure you've seen I'm running for mayor, and when I win, I will give you and your friends carte blanche to protect the city as you see fit. And once everyone sees how much better their tomorrows become, I'll run for president, win, and you and your friends can have the world. Black likes this. Now where did those other three characters come from? I thought about making them LexCorp lab rats that Luthor found and freed on the condition that they help Manchester Black fight Superman, but I think it's more interesting if they're just metahumans who agree with Black and after he broke with Superman and the two fought, they came to back Black up. I like it if their stories were all connected to some metropolis tragedy, like Coldcast was hit by a shot from Livewire that scrambled his atoms and gave him powers that also killed his parents. Menagerie was captured and experimented on by Desaad during one of Darkseid's invasions. Hat got some residual magic from a fight Superman had with Mixie Spitlick. Sort of like the victim syndicate from the recent Detective Comics. And these guys start causing trouble, executing robbers, anyone who commits a crime. And Luthor uses their platform to advocate for them. And support for the elite, as they are now called, grows. Meanwhile, Lois is looking for Clark, but she can't find him. She can even be on a boat captained by Bibbo Bibowski, the keeper of the second best name in comics besides Hat. But no luck, until Jimmy finds one of his pictures and notices something in the background. It's a man with a flying suit who wasn't involved in the fight. The man seems to dive underwater and disappears, and Lois recognizes the suit. She tracks down Irons and finds Superman. Unbeknownst to us, Irons used his suit to rescue Superman and is nursing him back to health. He's still knocked out, but he's alive. Irons tells Lois that he wants to protect Superman, who he reveals saved him a long time ago and told him to live a life worth saving, Irons' comic origin. Irons has also broken ties with Luthor because he is uncomfortable with how close Luthor is getting to the Elite. He also shows Lois he's working on something. He's fitted his suit with some armor and a big giant hammer. He's gonna try to fight the Elite himself. Lois says, he'll die, and Iron says, he doesn't care, somebody needs to stand up to them. He leaves her with Clark and goes to stop the Elite. Steel finds the Elite at a Lex Luthor campaign event. Manchester Black says, here to join us, Metal Man? It's Steel, and no, what you're doing is wrong. You know it, everybody knows it, but they're afraid of you, so I'm here to end that. Show them you're just a punk with a weird tattoo and a bad haircut. Black sends the rest of the Elite to fight Steel, and they beat him down, although he does get a few good hits in, but it's not looking good. Clark wakes up with Lois, and she tells him what's going on. He says he needs to help. Lois says Clark can't beat them all. Clark says he has to try, and goes for it, and now we're in our climax. Also, because Lois has been investigating Manchester Black, trying to figure out who he is so they can find a weakness, she gets an email from Jimmy with some information he just found. She needs to tell Superman so he can use this new information to beat Black. So we've got a fight between Superman and the Elite that Lois is also racing to, which means we could have some fun with her trying to get to Metropolis for this fight. Superman returns to find a barely alive Steel. Manchester's ready to execute him. Superman says, Manchester Black, looks like you're not so good at killing after all. Black's a little confused, but he shakes it off. He says, don't worry, we'll cut your head off this time. And Superman and the Elite fight again. And Superman gets beat again. But eventually Lois gets to the fight and gets the information to Steel, who is able to fly to Superman and tell him how to beat Manchester Black. And Steel also has an idea, a way for Superman to get back to full strength. He tells Superman both things, but the audience doesn't hear them. Superman tells Steel something that we don't hear, and then he goes for the Elite one more time. From this point on, everything plays out pretty much exactly how it does in the original book. I guess we can't do the moon thing, but have the fight take place far away, so Coldcast's big blast doesn't destroy the entire city. And Steel helps Superman when Superman is disarming each member of the Elite, and it seems like he's killing them. That's Steel getting them off the field. Superman wins, gives his big speech about how he'll never stop fighting, Luthor loses the election, and the movie ends with a conversation between Superman and Luthor. Superman meets Luthor on the roof of the LexCorp building. He says, you knew. You're gonna have to be more specific. You knew about Black's powers, how to stop them. I don't know what you're talking about. We found Manchester Black's x-rays. You were the only other person who accessed those files. You didn't trust him. I don't trust anyone, especially anyone with powers. At least he was human. More human than you. Is there a reason for this little visit? I wanna make sure you hear it from me. The people aren't afraid of you. You're fear-mongering. They're better than that. They are afraid of you, though. Deep down, they have a feeling. You don't belong here. You're dangerous. And eventually, they'll come to their senses and cut you out of this city. What will you do then? I don't know. 
But I know I'm going to keep fighting as hard as I can to prove you wrong. And he's not doing it alone. And Steel flies up and stands with Superman. Because that's the thing I always missed about what's so funny about truth, justice, and the American way. Sure, the conflict comes from Black pushing back against Superman's morality, but Black has a point. Something about this system is not working. Villains keep escaping and hurting people. The answer to that in the books is, that's tough, killing is wrong, Superman's right. Which I like for a single issue comic. And while Superman can have that kind of flat character arc where he doesn't change but forces the world around him to change, I think we do still need some form of growth for the world. Superman cannot just represent a status quo that many people are unhappy with. Which is why I think adding steel to this story is so important. He's the answer to Manchester Black's problem. Superman is not always there to save everybody, so you need to kill the villains. Or some of the regular people can help. Find a way to support Superman. Eventually enough heroes like Superman and Steel can keep the city safe without turning it into a police state. I think Superman has always been sort of a lonely character. Clark is the last survivor of an alien race. Very few people understand him. And for that reason, Superman can tend to take on problems by himself, especially in the movies. They are frequently about the fact that Clark does not see himself as part of the human race. And sure, by the end of Batman v Superman, Clark has allies in Batman and Wonder Woman, but Clark needed to die to earn those allies. I would like to see a Superman movie where at the end Superman makes a friend. A superpowered buddy that gets him. And I think it's extra special if that character is someone who Clark saved previously and then they went on to save Clark. They're equals. The other bonus to this story is that it's relatively grounded. If in the next movie Superman wanted to save the world from a big planet destroying threat like Mongol or Brainiac, that would be a logical escalation. I find it tough to go backwards. Start by fighting the god of evil in space and then follow that by beating up one telekinetic guy. This is the only time we get to tell a story like this without the next movie feeling small. Before Superman goes big, we tell a personal story establishing Clark's values. So that's my pitch. Superman vs Manchester Black with more Luthor and the introduction of Steel. Who could totally get a spin-off movie if that's what you want. And obviously, like everyone has said before me, this movie should be called Superman Man of Tomorrow. And because of its subject matter, I think my pitch earns that title. So I hope you like that pitch, James. And I know Kevin watched Nebula, but if you want to too, now is a great time to join because you can watch my next video right now. What's it about? Thor 4. I get so many tweets asking for me to take a look at Thor 4. And this is not a rewrite or a one small change. I just want to take a video to explore what might be my biggest issue with that movie. One thing that just gets under my skin and the more I sit with it, the less sense it makes. So you can watch that video in a few weeks when it shows up on YouTube or right now on Nebula. From now on, whenever I put a video on YouTube, the next video that's going to go up on YouTube is going to already be on Nebula. We're calling it Nebula first. So if you want to watch my next video about the scene that broke Thor 4 for me and how that scene brought the worst problem in the Marvel Cinematic Universe to the surface, well before the video goes on YouTube, Nebula is the place to go. You're basically living in the future. It's really cool. Other creators are trying it. Give it a look. It has its own spot on the homepage. If you've ever been thinking about Nebula, this is a great time to join. And we have partnered with this video sponsor, Curiosity Stream, to bring you a bundle that includes Curiosity Stream's incredible documentary content. Like this one called Little Cats, which I said I would watch last time. Time and I did and no surprise it's very cute and interesting you learn something from it but it is cute and you get all that for less than $15 a year barely $2 a month it is such a steal and get this we are running a holiday special so if you sign up before January 2nd you can get a year of nebula for less than a dollar a month the landing page doesn't make it super clear but if you use my link and you sign up for the cheapest annual plan on there it does give you access to nebula and curiosity stream for less than $12 a year it's an incredible deal. Go to curiositystream.com slash Nando and sign up and then go to Nebula and watch my next video. As always, huge thanks to all my patrons, people who listen to Mostly Nitpicking, and everyone who watches these videos on Nebula. Stay safe, everybody.